amount of money laundered every year is estimated at 2 to 5% of global GDP. 2% of global GDP is roughly equal to the combined GDP of Turkey, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. Over half a trillion dollars flows out of developing countries each year. Much of this money flows into Western economies via complex offshore structures. In 1952, the future Kenyan president, Jomo Kenyatta, is imprisoned by the British colonial authorities. He becomes a symbol of Kenya's struggle for independence. Jomo Kenyatta is viewed as, as Kenya's father of independence, so to speak. He used to go by the name Johnstone Kamau. He used to be a water meter reader in uh, the colonial government's municipal council. He was also fairly well spoken. Um, I believe that's part of the reason why he was selected from amongst the political intelligentsia at the time. Upon his release from detention, the near penniless Kenyatta becomes a close friend of the last British governor of Kenya, Malcolm MacDonald. In 1963, Kenyatta is elected as the first prime minister and later president of independent Kenya, while Malcolm MacDonald becomes the British high commissioner. The government and civil service of the new country is comprised primarily of what the British called loyalists. Post-independence, Britain retains a number of military sites in Kenya. Today, Britain trains six infantry battalions in Kenya every year. Sixty years after independence, the Kenyatta family is one of the wealthiest in Kenya. The Kenyatta family have vast investments in land um, across the country right down to the coast, all the way up to the, to the, what was called the White Highlands. They own the biggest milk company in, in Kenya. They own one of Kenya's biggest banks. They have a chain of hotels. They're building a sub-city right now, out, just right outside the, um, the bounds of, uh, of Nairobi City. There's always been an open question about how Jomo Kenyatta was able to become such a rich person. Um, just, you know, one or two years after becoming president, his salary at the time doesn't match the kind of wealth that he has. There have been memoirs written by, you know, people from his administration that say that he essentially would, you know, engage in land grabs. Um, of very, very prime pieces of land owned by members of the settler community, etc. A declassified CIA report noted that funds provided by foreign governments in order to pay for the redistribution of land from colonial settlers to landless Kenyans had allegedly been used by the Kenyatas and their associates to buy land for themselves. Today, the Kenyatta family are the biggest landowners in Kenya holding over 500,000 acres of prime land across the country, while many former Kenyan freedom fighters and their families who fought specifically for the return of their land received nothing. Jomo Kenyatta passed away in 1978. His son, Uhuru Kenyatta, followed his father into politics. The country's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, was among the world's rich who were named this week in the Pandora Papers. According to the Pandora Papers, Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, and six members of his family have been linked to 13 offshore companies. And what was revealed is that the family had invested in, in um, offshore um, structures. For if you're including the, the extended family as early as the mid 70s, Uhuru Kenyatta was listed as a beneficiary of a trust that, so to speak, belonged to his mother upon her death. Uhuru Kenyatta claimed to be an advocate of transparency, and cracking down on corruption was a central theme of his term in office. This dragon, this beast called corruption, is an animal that we intend to slay. President Uru Kenyatta welcomed the leakage of the Pandora Papers, saying the publication of the papers will go a very long way in enhancing the financial transparency and openness required in the country and around the globe. In Kenya, two-thirds of the population live in poverty on less than $3.20 per day. 
70% of Kenyan families are chronically vulnerable due to poor nutrition, food insecurity, and preventable diseases. Kenyan law requires the president to provide a list of financial interests to the Ministry of Finance each year. What we own, what we have, is open to the public, and we declare every year. And I've always said, if there is an instance where somebody can say that what we have done or obtained has not been legitimate, say so, we are ready to face any court. He said that he's made his wealth declarations, but we've never seen them. Secondly, it, can, um, families of, uh, of uh, politically exposed persons don't have to declare their wealth. Between the year that he got in 2013 and today, those have been very good years for the Kenyatta's um, wealth. There is this feeling um, that the Kenyatta's, as well as other political elite, they have become fabulously wealthy at a time when Kenya is suffering from the worst levels of corruption that it has seen in years. How it's been described is that there's been one rule for the elite, especially the elite that's connected to power, and another for everybody else. So that's what the perception is. I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah. The Kenyatas are what are known as politically exposed persons, or PEPs. A politically exposed person is someone who holds a public function and as a result presents a higher risk of being involved in bribery or corruption. Politically exposed persons, in theory, have access, or potential access, to public funds uh, within particular countries and our investigations have come up with lots of evidence that unfortunately there are PEPs who have been stealing public funds and moving it into places like the UK, either to hide it, to clean it, or to spend it. So PEPs are incredibly significant when it comes to the money laundering picture. And that's why uh, professionals in the regulated sector, in the private sector, are supposed to do enhanced due diligence whenever they have a client who is a politically exposed person. Unfortunately, there are multiple cases that we have found where that clearly hasn't happened. I could think of one, uh, you know, former political official who was accused of embezzling a lot of money. This was splashed all over the internet. Uh, within the five years following that, this person was able to open several UK bank accounts, took out a few mortgages on UK houses, opened um, a UK company. Can you show who that person was? Because of slap suits in the UK, which I'm sure you're really aware of, we're very aware of them, unfortunately. Um, I have to like literally libel check everything I say, learn it like a script, and then say it, so I can't. Even if that is already in the public domain. Yeah, it's a it's a big issue. Journalists like yourselves, NGOs like us, are often targeted by very expensive lawyers in London, <laughs> unfortunately, who take on dubious clients. Uh, and basically pursue, pursue, pursue NGOs, pursue journalists for daring to mention the corrupt dealings of, of these people. The Kenyatas are not the only developing world political dynasty who have amassed wealth and land beyond their known sources of income. Since coming to power after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Aliyev family of Azerbaijan have accumulated a vast fortune and business empire. Azerbaijan is a major crude oil and natural gas producer. Fossil fuels are so abundant that surface oil deposits have burned for centuries. The UK is the largest foreign investor in Azerbaijan, making up over half of all foreign investment. The Aliyev family is the richest family in Azerbaijan. They came to power in 1993 when Heydar Aliyev, a former KGB general and secretary general of Azerbaijan's Soviet Republic, orchestrated a coup. In 1993, Heydar Aliyev seized power in a coup. Shortly before Heydar Aliyev's death, his son, Ilham Aliyev, took over as president and has remained in power ever since. BP arrived in Azerbaijan in 1992, and after the coup, signed a secret deal with the new president. Today, 
BP is the largest foreign oil company in Azerbaijan. The political opposition has always said that British Petroleum was responsible for the state coup. They brought Haider Aliyev to power. I remember in 1993, during that difficult electoral and coup period, the British private security companies were doing something in Azerbaijan. Maybe they came to protect someone high-level officials of British Petroleum. Or maybe they came to help protect members of the Aliyev family. We don't know. Nobody knows what is in this contract between British Petroleum and Aliyev. It's like biggest state secret in Azerbaijan. On its website, BP calls this contract the contract for the new century. The Aliyev family have vast business interests in Azerbaijan. Who is the owner of five biggest commercial banks in Azerbaijan? It's the Aliyev family. Who is the owner of the biggest private transportation company? It's the Aliyev family. Who is the owner of the biggest five-star hotel networks in Azerbaijan? Again, it's the Aliyev family. They privatized the state's biggest banks, and after they made themselves owner of these banks, they start using these banks to launder money. Heads of state and other major figures have deposited vast assets offshore. It's according to a review of nearly 12 million files from around the world. It's the latest report by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The Pandora Papers expose a London property empire worth nearly $700 million amassed by the ruling family of Azerbaijan. So one of the properties that we looked at was on uh, Conduit Street in central London. This property was bought in 2009 by a company owned by one of the associates of the presidency of Azerbaijan. And then this property was basically sold shortly after that to the daughter who was 19 at the time. Um, Arzu Alieva, and eventually it was sold to the Crown Estate, um, which is, you know, owned by Queen Elizabeth II. The Aliyevs made a profit of 31 million pounds. There was another property in Mayfair, Maddox Street, which was transferred to um, Haider Aliyev. He was the 11-year-old son of the president of Azerbaijan. So, you know, overnight, um, the, the tenants started paying their, their rent to an 11-year-old Boy. In Kensington, there was a cluster of properties in one development called Thornwood Gardens. Over here in Hoburn, there was a, um, a hotel. When the Italian newspaper La Repubblica asked Ilham Aliyev about the Pandora Papers' revelations, he replied, Some forces in the West try to use these kind of insinuations or half-truths in order to discredit the image of Azerbaijan and undermine Azerbaijan's position. They want to accuse us. They want to subordinate us. They want to impose their will on us. And I say, no. I will defend Azerbaijan, its sovereignty, its independence, its choice until the end of my life. And all these kind of dirty stories mean nothing to me and to the people of Azerbaijan. In the Pandora Papers, we saw dozens of politicians and world leaders, current and former world leaders, with wealth offshore. Offshore service providers are supposed to uh, conduct enhanced due diligence and really scrutinize the sources of wealth of the politically connected people that they provide services to. The Pandora Papers revealed that offshore service providers did not conduct sufficient due diligence on their politically exposed clients. You know, there was some light Googling, running names through risk databases and things like that. The people conducting these checks are really doing um, checks to be seen to be doing checks. At the moment, it's very hard to pursue large banks and big firms for money laundering offences because we do not have a failure to prevent money laundering offence within UK law, which Transparency International very much believes we should have. Our research identified 582 UK individuals and firms who were involved in major money laundering cases. They have people who will uh, turn a blind eye uh, to any, anything they may discover, proceed anyway, and those who maybe don't do enhanced due diligence when they should. You will find individuals and firms that will actually deliberately go out to try and get the services 
uh, of those who are potentially involved in uh, corruption and criminality because it's, it's big business, it's big money. There are 84,000 UK properties that are owned anonymously. Uh, now, of course, some of those will be owned with the legitimate money, but it is quite possible that a lot will be owned with suspicious funds. Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, is an unusual place. It is not just the prevalence of stray cats that make it unusual, because even more prevalent than cats are police and security officials. There is a security official on every street, on every corner, even underneath bridges. Ornate parks of marble and sandstone are scattered throughout the city. Only in the suburbs and on the edges of Baku is the fairy tale confronted by reality. In 2005, Azerbaijan signed the UN Convention Against Corruption. One of the requirements of that treaty was to implement financial declaration for all state officials. Parliament ratified that treaty. Yet, until today, 17 years later, nobody is declaring their wealth. The first journalist who exposed the huge corruption in the government was killed at the front door of his house. After that, we saw that all journalists who spoke about stolen assets, they have a problem. They are put in jail. Their lives become extremely difficult. They are prosecuted. They are blackmailed with private family issues. The National Crime Agency, or NCA, is tasked with investigating money laundering in the UK. I think there are reasonable grounds for the NCA to investigate assets owned by or linked to the Alia family in the UK. It's not always entirely clear how the presidential family has made their wealth. Um, some of that money, at least, came through money laundering systems, laundromats, which are known to have funneled illicit money out of Azerbaijan. We wanted to ask the NCA why they had not opened an investigation on the Aliyev family's assets in the UK. The NCA did not agree to speak to us. When I was in Azerbaijan, the British Embassy occasionally invited us for breakfast with Ambassador and other British officials. They would tell us that they were afraid that if we did a strong investigation, we would put ourselves in trouble. They never give us any support to investigate corruption. British politicians, including British politicians in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, try to wash the negative image of Aliyev. You know who is the biggest lobbyist in Azerbaijan from the UK? He's the son of the Queen, Prince Andrew, Epstein's friend. He is also a friend of Aliyev, a very good friend. Every five years, the people of Azerbaijan elect a president. And every five years since 1993, that president's name has been Mr. Aliyev. In the 2008 election, Mr. Aliyev received 89% of the vote. In 2013, he received 84.5%, and in 2018, he received 86% of the vote. During the 2018 election, Emin Husseinov worked for an NGO investigating electoral violations. We observed the elections and discovered irregularities. After that, the government closed down our NGO. They confiscated all our equipment. They put most of us in jail. I decided to escape. The police in Azerbaijan were looking for me as if I was the number one terrorist in the country. They put my photo at the entrance of all metro stations. The taxi drivers and the bus drivers had my photo. I changed my appearance. I grew a beard and dyed my hair blonde. Secret agents were waiting in front of the Swiss embassy. They asked the guard, have you checked him? And the guard replied, this is not the guy you are looking for. The guy is a foreigner. Switzerland protect me. And after 10 months, the head of the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs came to Azerbaijan and he was able to take me with him to Switzerland. After that, President Alif illegally cancelled my passport 
and he stripped me of my citizenship. The Aliyev family's love of London property and use of offshore financial secrecy to hide their wealth is mirrored by another political dynasty of the developing world, the Sharifs of Pakistan. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has been disqualified from office. The court also disqualified the country's finance minister, Ishaq Dar. This uh, verdict was unanimous. All the five judges declared that Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is not an honest and sagacious person and hence he should be disqualified. Nawaz Sharif is the three times elected Prime Minister of Pakistan. During his premiership in the 90s, Nawaz Sharif privatized many state-owned industries. The privatization policies which were initiated by uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif during his stints uh, as Prime Minister during the 90s that is the start of corruption where a lot of uh, state holdings they were portrayed as if they are making losses and then they were handed out to different uh, political backers of Nawaz Sharif, his friends and uh, his business associates. The government of Nawaz Sharif then passed a law that the tax authorities in Pakistan could not question the origin of money that entered Pakistan from abroad. One thing which we need to remember and this is very, very important. When you're in the power, you can make laws according to your will. You can actually manipulate the system. You can tell, you can bribe the people. You can get cuts from wherever you want. And this is what the Sharifs has been doing. And this is what they've been accused over the years. It's a close-knit family affair. In the case of Hudabia paper mill, once you look at the directors and shareholders, it's only the entire Sharif family, uh, the immediate blood relations, and a few cousins who are also mentioned as directors. To look at uh, the shareholding of Ramzan Sugar Mill, that gives you an idea that it is uh, run by Chief Executive Officer Mr. Hamza Shabaz Sharif. Shabaz Sharif is a younger brother of Nawaz Sharif. He was the leader of the Punjab Assembly while his brother was Prime Minister. He is accused of laundering tens of millions of dollars through the Ramzan Sugar Mill, a company owned by the Sharif family. Accounts were opened in the name of these low-level, low-wage employees who do not come into the tax net. Money used to be deposited in those accounts and finally they used to land in the accounts of either Mr. Hamza Shahbaz Sharif, Mr. Suleiman Shahbaz Sharif or Mr. Shahbaz Sharif himself. In fact, uh, these files which you see here, it gives the names, it gives the banking do documents, the chalans, everything which is mentioned in these, uh, all the banking records. The names of the low-wage employees. Here is uh, one example, look at it. Mr. Masrood Anwar, he is depositing uh, this in the name of uh, Mr. Shehbaz Sharif. This is 1.6 million rupees. This was deposited in Habib Bank of Pakistan on 27th, 27th April 2017 when Shehbaz Sharif was the chief minister. This is another uh, deposit, 13th May 2016, in the name of uh, Nia Muhammad Shahbaz Sharif, an amount of uh, 6,52,451 rupees deposited in an account by Mr. Masood Anwar. 1 crore and uh, 90 lakh rupees being deposited in the account of Mr. Shahbaz Sharif by Masood Anwar. Now, you, you might ask, uh, who is Masood Anwar? Masrur and were according to this investigation uh, uh, by the Federal Investigation Agency was uh, a low-level employee of uh, Sharif family. Your own family member is the finance minister and uh, your other brother is the prime minister. So then entire banking chain was there to facilitate them and I was talking to one of the sources in the investigation uh, because once they investigated the bankers as to how it was happening under their nose and why they uh, didn't stop all these activities they said that people used to come with uh, gunmen uh, into the banks and one of the females the investigator said she was crying uh, a banking official that uh, what we could have done the bank managers they used to get a call uh, from uh, top, uh, top executives in the bank the banks themselves were part of this nexus of covering, covering up the corruption of the Sharif family. 
The so-called Panama Papers contain allegations of money laundering and tax evasion. Involving world leaders and where some of them are accused of hiding their money in many cases in an effort to avoid taxes. It was a surprise for uh, the people in Pakistan because it came out internationally. It had much more credibility because previously over the years the Sharif family had been using the ruse uh, that all these allegations against them are politically motivated. Sharif's three children are named in the Panama Papers. His family owns properties in London through offshore accounts. Sharif's daughter denies owning the London properties. Documents from her allegedly date back to 2006 and show she is a trustee of the properties, not an owner. But those documents are written in a font called Calibri, which was not commercially available until 2007. If you look at 1992 and 93, this is a very important time. Mariam Esser's grew 21 times, and there's no justification for that. In a single year, you are not a business owner. There's no business under your name, but 21 times your assets are going up. In 1992, Mariam Nawaz turned 19 years old. After the Panama Papers revelations, Pakistan's investigative agencies probed the financial affairs of the Sharif family. The joint investigation team basically found out that uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif uh, could not justify uh, the assets he had made uh, from known sources of income. That was one of the main charges. The matter was sent for criminal prosecution. In criminal prosecution, there was a trial which went on for almost a year. And in that trial, not even a single answer came from Mr. Sharif about the origin of his wealth or the explanation of those four Avonfield flats in London. Where is the money trail? That they have never been able to prove. The Sharif family is believed to be one of the wealthiest in Pakistan. But the origin of their wealth remains a mystery. The flat that you're living in at the moment, in, in Mayfair, was actually named in the Pakistani paper, The News, last year as one of four which was illegally bought by your father through various Swiss and offshore companies. Why don't people who, is, who are actually blaming us for that go to the court and prove it? But do you know who owns the flat that you're living in? Well, that is not the question right now. Why not? But it's the question I'm asking you. Do you know who owns the flat? Well. It's on a rent. It's, I'm, I'm ring on a rent basis which comes from every, every uh, quarter from Pakistan. You're and renting it personally or the money comes from Pakistan? The money comes from Pakistan. I'm just like any other student living with his parents. I doesn't necessarily have to know about what the facts and what, who owns the flat and who pays for uh, the rent and who pays for my living. The family deserve all this. It is not my fault that I was born in a rich family, in a wealthy family. My grandfather earned that with the hard, hard work, sheer hard work. When you ask them that where you got this money from, they will start telling you the story of their late grandfather. At the time of independence, we came from India, we have businesses. Uh, seriously speaking, there's no business in the world which has no money trail. Uh, if you look at their tax filings, it doesn't come out as a big industrial family. The Sharifs uh, never featured in that uh, rich families of Pakistan. But uh, now if you make a list of the richest families in Pakistan, then definitely Sharifs uh, would feature in the top ten, maybe in the top five, because exact uh, amount of their holdings uh, as to how much is uh, hidden in uh, Luxembourg, in UK, in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, what is in different bank accounts uh, in the United States, uh, that is not known. Whether it is $4 billion or $5 billion, that is not known. In December 2018, as a result of the Panama Papers revelations, Nawaz Sharif and his daughter are sentenced to seven years on corruption charges. Nawaz Sharif is granted bail for medical treatment in London and refuses to return to Pakistan. From London, Nawaz Sharif claims his downfall is a conspiracy by the Pakistani military.
मेरे पाकिस्तान का गरीब पड़ रहा है बाजवा साहब जवाब आपको देना होगा गरीब की रोटी दस रुपए की हो गई है बाजवा साहब जवाब आपको देना होगा और जनरल फैज जनरल फैज ये सब कुछ आपके हाथों से हुआ है जवाब भी आपको देना होगा आपने आपने नवाज शरीफ को बागी कहना है जरूर कहिए गद्दार कहना है जरूर कहिए इश्तिहारी कहना है जरूर कहिए हाई जैकब कहना है जरूर कहिए लेकिन नवाज शरीफ अपने गरीब और मजलूम आवाज की आवाज बनता रहेगा We contacted Priti Patel MP, the Home Office Minister, to ask her why Nawaz Sharif, who had overstayed his British visitor visa by 2 years, had not been extradited from Britain. Priti Patel had been eager to deport asylum seekers during her time at the Home Office, yet she took no action against Nawaz Sharif. Priti Patel MP in the Home Office did not agree to an interview. We also contacted the National Crime Agency. We wanted to find out why there had been no meaningful investigation into Nawaz Sharif's assets. The NCA did not agree to speak to us. Nawaz Sharif is not the only member of the Sharif family who has made London his home. London is the second home of House of Sharif. Hasan Nawaz is here, Hussain Nawaz is here, Hussain's children, Zikriya and another son is here, right? Hasan's children are here. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is here. And then if you look at uh, Ali Dar who is uh, the son in law of Nawaz Sharif Asma Nawaz Sharif who is the youngest daughter of Nawaz Sharif she's here uh, Ishaq Dar is here then Shabazz Sharif family is here as well uh, Suleiman Shabazz is here Ali Imran who is actually the son in law of Shabazz Sharif he also lives in this country uh, Shabazz Sharif's daughter Rabia Imran is also in this country and she is actually on a run and wanted in pakistan ali imran is wanted in pakistan ishaq dar is wanted in pakistan all these people are wanted in pakistan sitting in pakistan in third world country you look at it as to why most of the people who are wanted uh, by the courts in pakistan by the law in pakistan they find a refuge in uh, london uk it doesn't make sense to me London is the destination of choice for politically exposed persons and their family members who have accumulated vast fortunes beyond their known sources of income. These fortunes are frequently laundered or transferred offshore to or through British dependent jurisdictions where their origin and ownership are obscured and money can be reinvested into the global economy. Capital flight is a major concern for developing countries. we know that there is a huge uh, capital flight and it's not just specific to our time period it has been historical it directly impacts the economy because you see the issue is that if our currency is not doing well and we have a serious issue of uh, sustaining the value of pakistani rupee that has a correlation with capital flight The Financial Action Task Force or FATF, an intergovernmental money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog headquartered in Paris, had put Pakistan on its grey list of jurisdictions. Our financial systems have been made more accessible. Um we have sharing of information with almost everyone. Um we are pursuing many money laundering cases. Uh as far as we can pursue because of course the the missing element still is the cooperation from the other jurisdictions that is not forthcoming and sometimes we wonder that we are in grey list but the the money that has been taken from here is in countries which are not in the grey list so that is something that you know sometimes is like okay so why are we in the grey list then We approached the FATF for an interview. The FATF declined to speak to us. We would have liked to ask the FATF how it was possible for the UK, Switzerland and Luxembourg among others to be considered clean when these countries are known to be major money laundering centers 
through whose economies billions of dollars of illicit money are reinvested every year. The money is stolen here and it is hidden in the developed countries, in the developed world. If that is happening, it's not just the fault of Pakistani system that the money is able to go out. What I question is the, uh, the double standards. So for example, if you ask on one side from countries like Pakistan to have more checks and be more open, we expect in return the same from other countries when we are investigating someone. We will write a mutual legal requ assistance request to, let's say, Switzerland. And we will say that we have information that Mr. A has a bank account in Switzerland in such and such bank. We don't know the branch. We don't know the account number. But he's definitely in the system and his identity, date of birth, everything is shared and we will seek information. And maybe one year or two years after, we will receive certain questions from saying, uh, can you identify the branch or can you give us the account number? <laughs> Whereas we have said in our first request, we don't have those. When Pakistan Tariq and Saf government came into power, we uh, we formed an informal arrangement with the UK authorities called Justice and Accountability Initiative and uh, NCA also set up a small anti-corruption unit within NCA which was to assist in Pakistan on its request. The Home Office and the NCA, the UK's National Crime Agency, are responsible for dealing with mutual legal assistance requests by foreign states. Pakistan filed numerous MLA requests in relation to the Sharif family's assets in London. The requests on Sharif families are uh, taking a lot of time. It's taking way too long to take uh, some simple actions like, for example, freezing of assets or investigating the assets or the activities in the UK when people are you know, uh, facing charges or convicted of serious crime in Pakistan. Pakistan did its part. We did our investigation, we did our inquiry, uh, but has there been any investigation on British side? We don't know. What about the Mayfair, Mayfair Flats? What about the whole property portfolio of Hassan Nawaz that has come in Panama Papers? The impression that goes to people is that everyone who uh, commits such crimes or who is involved in corruption ends up in London, living in Mayfair Flats. The main issues for developing countries uh, are Western countries, unfortunately. Uh, here in the UK and other Western countries, we can be very good at pointing the finger elsewhere and saying, hey, look at all that corruption over there. But the reality is uh, we are facilitating that corruption. We are complicit. Uh, in the laundering of public funds because we have a ready-made system ready to go uh, where corrupt individuals can hide, can spend, uh, can clean their money. London and its role in the offshore world is that it's a money launderer's pet paradise. It's a money launderer's paradise uh, or haven. You know, it's, it's a place where if you want to stash um, illicitly uh, earned wealth, you can do so anonymously um, and you can do so with relatively few checks and balances. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. Thousands of troops backed by tanks and missile fire have crossed the border into Ukraine on every front. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called on all of its citizens who were ready to defend the country from Russian forces to come forward, saying Kyiv would issue weapons to everyone who wants them. We've already put in place the largest package of sanctions in our history. Today, the White House announced new sanctions against members of the Russian elite. Tying Russian oligarchs directly to assets is proving very difficult because they're all masters of using shell companies and relatives to hide their true ownership. For those who wish to hide their money, British dependent territories such as the Cayman Islands, Jersey and the British Virgin Islands are the destination of choice. In the past, Britain has claimed that these jurisdictions are independent and it cannot dictate their laws. 
I listened to the Foreign Secretary correctly detail the importance of avoiding sanctions leakage, and she was asked twice in this statement about British overseas territories. I detected a reluctance to go into detail on that. I have been very clear that we will absolutely be including overseas territories in all of these measures we are taking. We contacted the Foreign Office because we wanted to ask them if they would now take similar action against illicit money from other countries. The Foreign Office declined to be interviewed for this documentary. In order to help it seize Russian assets, the UK passed the Economic Crime Act. The aim of the Act is to help law enforcement identify and seize illicit money in the UK. The recent Economic Crime Act uh, basically passed into law that any trusts that are involved in the ownership uh, network of a property now have to um, declare the beneficial ownership to HMRC. However, that trust register is not public, so we're not entirely sure what information is even on it, whether that information is verified or how effective it is. Overseas trusts that own UK property will also have to register, well, and the law will have to register there. I don't know how much that will be enforced. In, in practice, it's hard to say. It's not really clear um, how, how exactly that's going to be implemented. Um, and, you know, so for example, if we look at um, the, the register of persons with significant control over UK companies, a lot of people complied with that. Uh, a lot of companies complied with that, um, but a lot didn't. They declared what appeared to be potentially nominees. Now, the UK government has promised to reform Companies House. At the moment, Companies House is not empowered to check and verify the information that is submitted to it. It's quite possible to write down, uh, like I said, Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, uh, not the real beneficial owner, and no one's really going to check that information. So when we look at setting up something similar for the, for the property register, you know, we're likely to encounter the same kind of problems. How many of them are actually going to, to comply? And if they do, how do we know that that's the real, you know, the real beneficiary who owns that? How do we verify that? It's not hard to see why UK companies have become a vehicle of choice for corrupt actors, for money launderers to, to use to move and hide their wealth because the enforcement is weak. We wanted to speak to the NCA about what they felt would help them tackle the issue of money laundering in the UK. The NCA did not agree to speak to us. The NCA is a department of the British Home Office. We were interested to find out if the NCA felt it could act outside of the ministry it forms a part of, or whether its prosecutions were directed by the interests of the government, rather than in the interests of the prosecution of crime. In February 2022, The Guardian newspaper reported that the former Conservative Minister, Lord Folkes, who attempted to introduce a public register of overseas property owners in 2017 and 2018, was approached by civil servants from four government departments who told him to drop the public register of overseas property owners. Lord Folkes told the newspaper that, it is a real irony that our reputation for protecting the rule of law is one of the things that attracts people who have very little regard for the rule of law themselves and come from countries which ignore it almost altogether. We approached the FATF, the National Crime Agency, the Foreign Office, John Glenn MP, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, and Priti Patel MP in charge of the Home Office. None of these individuals and organizations agreed to take part in this documentary. But when we contacted Imran Khan, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan agreed to our request for an interview. Hello, Michael. Nice to meet you. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Good. So you're not going to be in the uh, gallery? No, no, I will be asked. So, what is this? Is sort of like a, a documentary? Yes, it's, a, doc a, it's a documentary uh, about uh, individuals who have become very wealthy by being at, at the centre of power and uh, currently have a lot of wealth in London, especially in poverty. Corruption is is not just uh, an issue for Pakistan. It is an issue for all the poor countries. In fact. I've come to this conclusion that countries are 
poor only because of corruption and corruption of the elite. It's the corruption of the powerful that destroys a country, not the corruption of the weak. When I, as a prime minister, if I want to make money out of, from my country, steal money and then send it abroad, I can only do it if I weaken the, the state institutions that would check my corruption. So the institutions get corrupt and they get weaker and they cannot stand in front of the powerful. The richer countries must come forward and treat money taken out of poor countries, money laundered out of poor countries the same way as terror financing and as drug money. Because the, these two terror financing and drug money affect the richer countries, the laws are very strict. But there's hardly uh, you know, any attempt to stop this plunder of the poor countries. I feel that there is no incentive for rich countries to uh, repatriate money or take action against these people because they benefit from them. There are countries that are benefiting from money stolen from our countries and which are parked there. They are benefiting from billions of dollars which flow into their properties and their businesses stolen from this country. So what incentive would they have? We are the ones who suffer and this is the dilemma. We don't have the resources to get the money back and they don't have any incentive to send it back to us. So this is the big problem which the entire developing world is facing. I guess uh, it's a question of now hiring more expensive lawyers abroad. Uh, but you see, when you look at the, the laws, they basically favor, I mean, the, I'm talking about the richer countries as a whole, they tend to favor the crooks. It is so complicated to get your money back. Imran Khan has raised this issue in almost every forum that the rich countries must take care of uh, poor countries and the care involves that the looted money that was, uh, that is now invested in the rich countries must be returned to the original countries. In Panama Papers, the, the properties of Sharifs um, are categorically mentioned and all these properties are in the heart of London and uh, we, everyone including the British government knows that these properties are actually bought from uh, laundered money. I think uh, international politics play a big role here so some countries you know they say that what is ours is ours and what is yours is also ours so this is the case with British government right now. The United Kingdom that the United States increasingly that various other territories in the West are not only um, refusing to dismantle um, or make more open and accountable these kinds of systems, but are actively supporting territories that, that allow for the, the, the inflow of illicit financial wealth, and the world needs to be able to wake up to something like this. They'll, be, they'll shout about the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musks and, and, and Apples and all sorts of things, but they are eerily silent about the wealth that's being taken out and invested because it helps their countries. That's not right. We become victims twice, where when we are asking for our wealth to be returned, it becomes so difficult for us to have that happen. The Congolese still don't have the wealth from uh, Mobutu Sese Seko's reign returned. The Nigerians still don't have wealth from uh, Sani Abacha and many other people returned. Um, I'd say the same probably of the Dos Santos uh, regime. Countries that actively build these systems, actively finance these systems and protect them, don't do enough to be able to make them more open and accountable. That's just not right. Offshore leaks have revealed time and time again that politically exposed persons use secrecy jurisdictions to hide their wealth, launder their wealth, and reinvest that wealth back into the global economy. A large part of the international financial system and many of the major financial secrecy jurisdictions are controlled and regulated by Western interests. 
Imran Khan frequently spoke out against money laundering and offshore financial centers. His government challenged Western institutions and governments to return and reveal dirty money and undeclared assets of Pakistani origin, pursued an independent foreign policy, and angered the U.S. by refusing to host CIA sites on Pakistani soil. On the 7th of March 2022, the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S. reported in a classified communique that Donald Liu, a senior State Department official had informed him that Pakistan-U.S. relations could improve only if Imran Khan was removed from power. Khan actually accused the U.S. of being behind a conspiracy uh, to get him ousted uh, from power. The Prime Minister of Pakistan accused the U.S. of uh, working with the opposition to remove him from power. There is absolutely no truth to that allegation. We are not going to let uh, propaganda, misinformation, and disinformation, lies, uh, get in the way uh, of any bilateral relationship we have, including with uh, the uh, bilateral relationship we have with Pakistan. Prime Minister Imran Khan has been ousted from power. Lawmakers elected the opposition leader Shabazz Sharif as the country's new prime minister. A new dawn has started. A new day is coming. Allah has answered the prayers of millions. When Shabazz Sharif, the brother of Nawaz Sharif, was appointed prime minister on Monday the 11th of April, the Guardian newspaper wrote, he is known as a diligent administrator with such a great love of poetry that he often opens official meetings with recitals of famous revolutionary Urdu poets. His first words to Parliament were, one must set himself free from all bounds of desires. Imran Khan claimed he had been removed by a foreign-backed conspiracy. The US Embassy was calling members of, of my party, backbenchers who were not happy, and they were the first ones who then jumped ship. And they were the ones who then offered a million dollars each to buy my other members of parliament who actually jumped ship later on. And then Donald Lou's right. conversation with the ambassador. The next day, the no confidence motion is, fine, uh, is stable in the assembly. You have, what do you think? You have I, made some, you have made some significant allegations there. When it's not will allegations. you show we me have hard evidence. evidence? Why would I want to blame the US if I did not have hard evidence. This was an official message with no takers given to our ambassador, message received by me, by our president, given to the Chief Justice of Pakistan. This is real. Not only was a democratically elected government removed through the conspiracy, we have been replaced by a bunch of criminals. 60% of the cabinet which is sitting right now is on bail. The Prime Minister was about to be sentenced in a corruption cases of billions of rupees and his son. The Sharif doctrine is that you buy different people in all the important positions of power, whether it's in the media, you have your sympathetic journalists uh, who continue to argue for you uh, that uh, the country can only be saved by the wisdom of the Sharif family. The generals, once they retired, they are also accommodated. The judges, once they are retired, they are also accommodated. The journalists, they are also given a government position and they willingly take it. So it's the entire Sharif doctrine which uh, gives them the sense that uh, they can even get away with murder in Pakistan. Nawaz Sharif has learned that even though if you are out of power, if you manage to gain time and if you manage to delay the cases in the courts of law and once you come back into power, you can manage to get a clean check. So I think this time also the same strategy is being uh, followed by the Sharif family. I think uh, those in power, they think that they can get away with the crimes uh, they have done. And Sharif family has been benefiting from them uh, because of their international friends who have been coming to their rescue to strike the dirty deals. Someone once said that to accumulate wealth beyond one's wildest dreams, one must be close to the individuals who make the rules and who enforce those rules. When Shabazz Sharif's coalition government was appointed, one of its first actions was to pass an amendment to restrict the power of the National Accountability Bureau, 
which had been in charge of investigating white-collar crime by public office holders. The amendment, which was passed in June 2022, was to take effect retrospectively. The amendment stipulated that the courts had to decide on the outcome of a case within one year, and stated that if sufficient evidence was not provided at the time of the arrest, the arresting officer could face five years in jail for the filing of a false reference. Dr. Muhammad Rizwan, the 47-year-old chief investigator who presided over the investigation against Shabazz Sharif and his family in the Ramzan Sugar Mills case, died of a heart attack on the 9th of May, 2022. Another investigator on the same case suffered a heart attack and remains in critical condition. Malik Masood, through whose accounts prosecutors alleged 3.7 billion Pakistani rupees were laundered to various Sharif family members, had been cooperating with investigators when he too suffered a heart attack and died on the 7th of June, 2022. The 49-year-old had been a tea boy at the Ramzan Sugar Mills, where he drew a salary of approximately $300 per annum for his work at the Sharif family-owned enterprise. According to the Wealth Report, London is the wealth capital of the world, beating New York to the top spot. London is the favoured playground of the world's politically exposed oligarchs and their family members. The Sharif family of Pakistan, the Aliyevs of Azerbaijan, the Kenyatas of Kenya, and many other current and former politically connected families who acquired vast fortunes beyond their known sources of income own billions of pounds of prime London property. London boasts the greatest diversity of international property investors, with people from 45 countries owning properties in London. British-dependent jurisdictions continue to offer financial secrecy and tax evasion services. 84,000 properties in the UK are owned anonymously. The UK government has made repeated promises to crack down on dirty money, but on each occasion, the government has failed to implement the promised legislation or watered down the legislation so as to make it ineffective. Britain remains the capital of libel tourism, where the wealthy come to attempt to silence their critics. London continues to be a safe haven for the global elite that have fallen out of favour in their home countries. Pakistan under Imran Khan attempted for years to engage with Britain to repatriate laundered money. Many other developing countries have done the same without success. We approached numerous UK government bodies and ministers for this documentary. Not one agreed to speak to us. The FATF, the Intergovernmental Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Watchdog, headquartered in Paris, indicated in its first review after the ousting of Imran Khan that Pakistan had met all of the compliance recommendations to be removed from the FATF grey list. 